Not only is June the unofficial start of summer, but it's also Pride Month. Today, I wanna to walk you through a brief history of Pride and 14 books that are perfect, not only for celebrating the month, but for highlighting stories that may make us all better allies. I should also preface this with a disclaimer that I'm a cishet woman, which is a shorthand phrase meaning cisgender heterosexual. Here, cisgender means that I identify with the body and sex that I was born into. I don't belong to the LGBTQIA community, so I'm I'm sharing things that I've learned through my own research and through conversations with people and friends who do belong to this community. None of this is my own personal firsthand experience. So let's get into it. Starting in early cultures in ancient India and Egypt, gods transformed fluidly between male, female, and third genders, often taking lovers in each form. Chinese and Greek male aristocracy took on same-sex lovers as a symbol of status and power. Ancient Zapotecs respected the existence of a third gender, and many Mexican communities today still support gender nonconformity. Several African societies had openly gay rulers and transgender roles in power until colonial powers drafted and imposed homophobic laws. So we can see that the fight for LGBTQ rights started way before 1969 and that we're only in the most recent iteration of resisting heteronormative attitudes in society. And moving into more modern times, from the 1860s to the 1960s, we see Western gay identity make a shift from homosexual acts to homosexual people to an LGBTQ movement. In 1864, Karl Ulrichs, a German German man and the first known gay activist became the first theorist of homosexuality. He published 12 pieces between 1864 and 1879, and they were more than just explanatory, they were also emancipatory because he argued that homosexuality is inborn and not an acquired vice. In 1867, he made a speech before the Congress of German Jurists in Munich, where he appealed for the abolition of sodomy statute. Yorick's made great strides for queer visibility but not necessarily for their safety nor their acceptance. It's said that the first drag queen made an appearance in 1882. William Dorsey Swan was born into servitude in 1860 and there are no photos of him to be found. Even when you Google his name, this photo pops up but this actually is a different drag performer named Mr. Brown. Anyway, Swan dubbed himself a queen of drag and in 1888 was hosting one of his typical dance parties at a home in DC for his 30th birthday party. Unfortunately, he was faced with a surprise raid and this wasn't Swan's first nor last time being carried away in a police wagon, but his decision that night to fight was one of the earliest known instances of violent resistance in the name of gay rights. Moving on to 18. 1991, Oscar Wilde began an affair with Lord Alfred Douglas, a young British poet and aristocrat who was 16 years younger than him. At that time, Wilde kept his orientation a secret. He even had a wife and two sons. But in 1895, the details of the affair were made public and Wilde was put on trial. Britain's Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885 had criminalized all sex acts between men and only men, not women, as gross indecency. The trial ended with the jury unable to reach a verdict, so three weeks later, Wilde was retried. That time, he was convicted of gross indecency and served two years of hard labor, which was the maximum sentence allowed for the crime. While researching for this video, I also discovered that the green carnation that you sometimes see in photos of him became a queer symbol in 1892. Oscar Wilde instructed a handful of his friends to wear them on their lapels to the opening night of his comedy, Lady Windermere's Fan. They were meant to be a secret, subtle hint that you were a man that loved other men. And this also helps me to better understand Elliot Page's look at the Met Gala, which was his first red carpet appearance since transitioning. Starting in 1917, the US military discharged soldiers for homosexual acts. There was then an accidental shift in societal perspectives from homosexual acts to homosexual people in 1917. 1942, when this was classified as a mental illness, disqualifying gay men and lesbians from service. Although the military discharged only a few thousand gay service members each year, those numbers eventually accumulated to about 100,000 disenfranchised veterans. Among them were several gay and lesbian advocates who brought increased visibility to the gay political movement. When prohibition came to an end in 1933, state agencies regulated bars with vague standards against disordered 
disorderly premises and moral indecency, which were interpreted to prohibit serving gays. In the 1960s, the gay community blossomed in New York City, but they had no safe space to gather. The mafia, which had a stranglehold on the nightlife scene, took its experience with speakeasies and used it to operate gay bars. In 1966, Fat Tony purchased the Stonewall and ran it on the cheap. It was dirty and dangerous. There was no running water behind the bar, glasses were cleaned by being dunked into tubs of dirty water, and the club lacked a fire or emergency exit. Still, it became a popular destination in the gay community. Some even called it an institution. Fat Tony paid the NYPD about $1,200 per week to turn a blind eye to what was happening inside, but that didn't mean that raids didn't happen anyway. Cops would tip off owners and those owners would tell them the best time to come, and they would also change the lights from blue to white inside the bars to warn customers. But on June 28, 1969, the police didn't tip off Fat Tony and the bar was raided, but this time a crowd gathered and trapped the police. For six days, crowds rioted, firing back bricks and Molotov cocktails at the police on Christopher Street. And this is where we move from homosexual people to an LGBTQ movement because some scholars argue that the riots were not only pushing back against police harassment and discriminatory laws, but also against the mob's exploitation of the gay community. On the last stop of our history tour, we'll pop by 1981 where a rare cancer began spreading through the community. And as we learn more, or instead of committing to national resources or receiving front page coverage like Legionnaire's disease did just a few years earlier, the government and the media were silent. In 1982, when nearly 1,000 people died from AIDS, Reagan's press secretary, Larry Speaks, had a conversation with a journalist where he treated the epidemic like a joke. Two years later, when more than 4,200 people had died, Speaks continued to engage in joking and apathy about AIDS. After Reagan won re-election, gay activists felt increasingly ignored, angry, and abandoned to weather the rising AIDS crisis. It wasn't until September 1985, four years after the crisis began, that Reagan first publicly mentioned AIDS. So with all of that history, you can understand the importance of this month and being able to celebrate the trials and tribulations this community had to overcome and some of the challenges it still faces today. You're a real one for sticking with me through that, so drop this video a like and we'll get to talking about books. I've broken this part of the video out into different sections for LGBTQIA. In each, I'll give a short definition and we'll talk about one fiction and one nonfiction book, giving us 14 in total. Lesbians are most often defined as a woman who is attracted to other women, romantically, sexually, or both. The fiction book is Fiber Tropical by Juliana Delgado Lopera. The book is a coming of age and coming out story following a 15 year old Colombian girl in Miami, and it balances topics like migration, queerness, and mental health, all in a light tone, making it an easy read. What I think is interesting is that the book also features some Spanglish, so a mix of Spanish and English, which is pretty unique. And for the lesbian nonfiction, we have 10 Steps to Nanette by Hannah Gatsby. Gatsby is an Australian comedian that I absolutely adore. I've not read this book yet, but I have watched her stand-up comedy special called Nanette, and it's one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen and has stuck with me since seeing it. Behind every single joke is a story. Stories about sexism, homophobia, and assaults. Incredibly raw stories about growing up lesbian in Tasmania where homosexuality was illegal until 1997. I'm happy to see that she's sharing more of her experiences through this new book, which has been described as equal parts harrowing and hilarious. Gay is an adjective referring to those who have have physical, romantic, and or emotional attraction to people of the same gender. And in a broader sense of the word, gay can be used as an umbrella term to identify any LGBTQIA individual. Our fiction book here is The Kingdom of Sand by Andrew Holleran, and it's the author's first new book in 16 years. It follows a nameless character who moves to Florida to care for his aging parents. After they pass away, he finds that he's unable to leave this small town. In the book, we learn about his upbringing, 
and his relationship to his parents, how he took care of them both, and the way that he eventually fears taking care of Earl, a close friend of his who's 20 years older than he is. The book also explores the anxieties the character has around how someday someone will have to take care of him as well. Our nonfiction gay book is Hola Papi, How to Come Out in a Walmart Parking Lot and Other Life Lessons by John Paul Brammer. He grew up gay and biracial in Oklahoma and is a former advice column writer. Hola Papi is a collection of essays structured as responses to those who have written to him seeking guidance, which is a pretty unique angle to a memoir. In the book, he takes us through his journey to become the Chicano Carrie Bradshaw of his generation. Bisexual is a label that describes an attraction to two or more genders on the gender spectrum. The bisexual fiction book that I want to share is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V. E. Schwab. The book follows Addie LaRue, who makes a deal with a mysterious god in an attempt to get out of her marriage. She's given immortality, but the trade-off is that everyone she ever meets is bound to forget her. After 300 long years, she finally hears the words, I remember you. Addie experiments with how to make a mark on the world through her art and music, despite the limitations of her curse, and readers get a subtle lesson in making the most of the time that we're given. The bisexual nonfiction that I've chosen is Hunger by Roxane Gay. This is a memoir about food, fatness, and feminism. It explores the sexist stereotypes that are designed to keep women's bodies in line and her pursuit of fatness as a protest against sexualization. She recounts her relationship with childhood sexual assault and uses her story to initiate discourse on body neutrality and self-compassion. And just a note, bisexual women experience a higher rate of sexual assault than any other cisgender population. They also experience a higher rate of eating disorders, and this book helps to bring more awareness to those under-acknowledged statistics. Transgender, which is often shortened to trans, is an umbrella term that describes someone whose gender identity differs from their assigned gender at birth. Infants are assigned a sex that's recorded on their birth certificate, which is usually based only on the appearance of external genitalia. Talia. That birth assignment assumes that their gender identity will correspond with the assigned sex, which doesn't always work out like that. A popular YA book that features a trans character is Felix Ever After by Kassen Callender, and we've been seeing it talked about a lot lately because this book has been banned and challenged recently. The book explores identity, race, sexuality, bullying, those confusing emotions that teens go through, friendships, family dynamics, and ultimately, Felix's journey to self-love. And for our nonfiction trans book, there's Jacob Tobias' Sissy, which is a coming of gender story. It's a complex and introspective piece about gender and sexuality and how societal expectations and norms can impact self-worth. They describe what it was like for them growing up surrounded by people who not only didn't accept them, but also didn't understand them, and how none of the labels people attempted to place on them felt appropriate. Queer is an identifier for individuals and or the community of folks who are not cishet. It can be used instead of or in addition to other identifiers of sexual orientation and can refer to gender identity or gender expression, either as a standalone term or part of another, like in gender queer. Our queer fiction book is a thick one at 620 pages, and it is Black Leopard, Red Wolf by Marlon James. It's set in a lightly reimagined pre-colonial Africa that's densely populated with African myths and fables like witches, fairies, giants, vampires, flesh-eating trolls, devils, and shape-shifting humans. On the surface, this is a story about a mercenary who's hired to find a missing child, but really, this is a story about things lost and searched for. Identity, purpose, humanity, innocence, love, trust, family, memory, sanity, childhood, so many things. I attended an event back when I was living in San Francisco right after the book was released, and James mentioned that he was really interested in the same story told from the perspective of three different parties involved. And it's no surprise to me that this book is the first in a trilogy. The second book was released in February of this year, but I do feel that this book reads well on its own. So if you choose to read it, there's no pressure to feel compelled to complete the series if you don't want to. 
through. On the nonfiction side, I want to talk about Messy Roots, which is a graphic novel by Laura Gow. She immigrated to Texas from her hometown, which felt pretty foreign to her, at least until it became a household name after COVID hit Wuhan, China. The book actually started out as a comic she drew and posted to social media, The Wuhan I Know. She wanted people to know about the rich culture of the city, something beyond what was seen in the headlines. In the book Messy Roots, Gao unpacks aspects from her own identity, from being queer to growing up Wuhanese American in a small, mostly white town in Texas. The themes are serious, but they're packaged in a charming and light graphic novel. Intersex is a term used for a variety of situations when a person is born with reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't fit the boxes of female or male. Middlesex is a novel by Jeffrey Eugenides, and it follows the story of Cal, an intersex man who, in an exercise of self-discovery, decides to write his life story. The story spans nearly a century and covers complex family drama over multiple generations and explores things like incest, emigration, and family secrets. Eugenides skillfully weaves together history and fiction in the book as well. The history is part of the story rather than just a device to situate a fictional tale. A memoir written by Kimberly Zieselman called XOXY is the nonfiction intersex book we'll be looking at today. Zieselman found out that she was intersex at the age of 41. In the book, readers are taken back in time where she recounts having surgery as a teenager. She's led to believe that she's having her uterus and her partially formed ovaries removed due to a potential cancer risk. Later, her doctor of 14 years leaves her in an exam room to look at her records where she finds out that she's intersex. The book interweaves her journey of self-discovery with her story of being a working woman, a wife, and a mother to two adopted children. She highlights her struggles with the medical community, from the doctor that lied to her about her teenage surgery, to the doctor of a decade and a half telling her she was intersex. This is such an important book because there's so few out there on this topic. This was by far the hardest part of the research for this video. Asexual refers to people who do not experience sexual attraction towards others. They may experience other forms of attraction, such as romantic, sensual, or aesthetic. Asexuality is a sexual orientation, not a gender identity, behavior, or a medical condition. Loveless by Alice Oseman follows Georgia, who realizes that she's a little bit different from her friends in that she's never been in love, never been kissed, and has never had a crush on anyone. Through the characters, the readers get an explanation of what asexuality and aromanticism mean and what they represent. It's also worth noting here that the author also identifies as asexual and aromantic, so if you're looking for something that is own voices, this might be for you. Ace is the shortened name for asexual, and it's also the title of the last book on this list by Angela Chen. In it, she navigates her own asexuality and weaves in the perspectives of a diverse group of asexual people. Structured as interviews, cultural criticism, and a memoir, the book takes a look at what asexuality reveals about consent, compromise, and about the structures of our society. The history of this month and the books on the list are both important in their own rights. The former for honoring the struggles members of the LGBTQIA community have had to and continue to have to endure, and the latter for representation, which is important for all minority groups. And that's particularly critical when we think about raising the next generation of children to be socially aware, compassionate, and maybe even reflected in the media they consume.